Afternoon, everybody. I'm Pastor Chris. Welcome to Niles First Christian Church. Whether you're joining us in person or, or online, we welcome you here for our uh, continuing Bible study. We're making it through the Gospels, and so far we have made it, well, to the to the third chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. We've only been working a few months, though, so we got time to keep going. Um, we invite you to grab a Bible and uh, read along with us as we begin this study this afternoon. But uh, the very first thing we should do is uh, to join together in prayer. So let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for this day, for this opportunity to gather, to focus on your presence in our lives. Not only do we know that you abide with us and you go with us where, where, wherever we might go, but uh, that you have revealed yourself to us uh, through those mighty in faith, through history. And as we look to their words, as we look to their understanding of who you are and, and, and what you are doing for us, uh, might we find how you speak to us today? Might we hear in our conversations with each other uh, that still quiet voice that, uh, that you are abiding with us and calling us to new creation? So in all these things, might we be inspired, might we be encouraged, and might we be strengthened in our faith as we go forward uh, to do your will, to, to uh, bring forth the, the realm in this world? Through all these things we pray through the Spirit and through the Christ. Amen. Uh, so I wanted to, to chunk this little part of Matthew, the end of Matthew chapter 3 together. Um, I was considering tackling the entire chapter together, but uh, we, we, we end up spending an hour on a very, uh, on tertiary things. Uh, I don't know, we could spend three or four classes on just the Herod. So I'm trying to be careful and break it down in such a small way that we can work through this together. Um, oh, I think we lost Paige Lynn there. She should, she'll probably come right back. She probably had to like get out and then back in. I think you're right. I think you're right, Julie. All right. Well, it's what we got here. So um, the very first thing we should do is uh, read this together. So I invite you to uh, hear this reading uh, from the New Revised Standard Version. Of course, any any translation you have is great and often helps us to compare a little better with each other. Uh, so hear this, uh, Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 through 17. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came out of the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. So we have here the um, Matthew's rendering of the baptism of Jesus. Uh, earlier in the chapter, which we took a look at uh, last week, we have the introduction of John the Baptist uh, and the unique way that he was baptizing. Uh, what we had talked about previously is the baptism water cleansing rituals uh, were inherent in Judaism as a way to uh, provide physical cleanliness, specifically before worship, uh, especially before going to the temple. Uh, there were a lot of things that could make people unclean, things that just happened in day-to-day -day life. Um, there are, let's see, I, I in my new interpreters dictionary. Uh, I have a little bit of information specifically about that. Um, let me find it. <laughs> we have, um, so in, we have uh, in the Hebrew scriptures, there's a lot of different things that could render a body ritually unclean. Contact with a corpse, uh, which is named in Numbers and Leviticus, skin diseases, Levit Leviticus 13, and bodily discharges in Leviticus 15. Immersion in water was used to rid the body of ritual impurity after someone had a contagious skin disease, a genital discharge, contact with a corpse, a seminal emission. It was required when a person had eaten an animal that died a natural death or been savaged, touched the body, bed, or chair of someone with a genital discharge, or sat on their chair, been spat on by such a person, uh, or carried un anything under him or them, or touched the bed or seat of, uh, of a person that was menstruating. Uh, by implication, one would probably have been immersed after touching, picking up, or eating a carcass of an unclean animal. 
Um, and there are, alongside immersion, various types of uh, sprinkling sacrifices and the passage of time could be required before ritual purity was reestablished. Uh, so uh, ritual purity was something that was a necessary part of just moving through life. There were a lot of things that could make you unclean, not that made you. Sometimes we equate uh, cleanliness and uncleanliness with sin, uh, and that's not quite what it is. We hear it in a different frame uh, because of our culture and because of the, the dogmatics of Christianity over a millennia or two. Um, but in Judaism, there's a lot of stuff that can make you ritually unclean that is just part of life. Uh, and those ritual cleansings then are a necessary part of, uh, of, of of maintaining righteousness, of following God's law. Um, and a lot of it has to do with, with God being holy and some of these things that specifically relate around life, um, like childbirth, menstruating, uh, eating clean and unclean animals. They're things that, that have to do specifically with life. So that interaction of, of day-to-day life and, and, the uniqueness of God's presence in life can can be dangerous. Um, so before going to the temple, there was a lot of reasons to uh, be a part of this ritual immersion of baptism. John the Baptist takes it in a unique path and starts to frame it as a uh, spiritual cleanliness, uh, that these things, are, that, that the baptism that John the Baptist is doing is, um, is for the remission of sins. Uh, and that's the way we use it. We took it pretty much uh, whole cloth from John the Baptist. Um, but we run into a big issue then, because if John the Baptist baptism is for the remission of sins, what's Jesus doing? <laughs> and, and we see the gospel authors tackle this in different ways. It's really a difficult question. Uh, Jesus's baptism makes it into all four gospels, which... Um, exegetically tells us that it's an incredibly important story to the life of Jesus, also that it must have happened. Uh, there's some debate amongst scholarship as, you know, if, if something just happens in one gospel, is it the author's embellishment or uh, it, did it serve a literary purpose? There's a lot of, of argument in, in those things, but if it makes it into all three of the synoptics, you know, it's very important. If it makes it into John's as well, you know, it's foundational and almost certainly happened in a way that is is uh, compiled by the gospel authors. And that's what we have today. Uh, today. Uh, Jesus' baptism makes it into all four gospels. But if you notice, uh, and for this, we will use a exegetical and exegetical tool called a uh, gospel parallel. How am I? Did I do that right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I didn't know if I was upside down. Uh, a gospel parallel takes the synoptic gospels and lays them out right next to each other. Oftentimes, if we try and do exegetical work comparing the gospels or uh, uh, comparing parallel passages in scripture, you also see it sometimes in, in the Hebrew scriptures. Uh, it's difficult be because the Bible is kind of hard to read sometimes. It's it's okay. We, we can admit that. Um, and when we just read it through, we miss the parallels, the potential discrepancies. We miss the nuances between the different uh, pieces of literature. So if you have them laid out like this, it's a really, really neat tool to be able to look at the differences, the similarities, uh, get a feel for what the, the gospel authors were trying to convey, uh, and what we can do to in interpret uh, what we're being told or what we're hearing uh, from the divine as we, as we meditate over the scripture. So uh, this is a particularly unique opportunity to do this, as it is with the the infancy narratives or, or other major life events like the um, like Holy Week uh, that are so important and foundational to the life of Jesus that they have to be included that we can compare the the different pieces of literature. Particularly, there is this question of why did Jesus need to be baptized uh, if John the Baptist is laying this out that that baptism is for the remission of sins, there should be no reason for Jesus to be baptized. Uh, the different gospel authors try to argue this in slightly different ways. Um, I have one, and I'll have this, I'll have this handout at church, uh, but I have them all on one document. Unfortunately, it's about eight point font, so it is incredibly difficult to read. Uh, but if we look at it, we can see, uh, actually, if we could take a look at this, Matthew uh, argues, our, our reading for today, Matthew argues that uh, Jesus demands to be baptized 
because it it is a way to fulfill all righteousness. Uh, we're going to have to unpack that a little bit because, you know, what does that mean? Um, in the Gospel of Mark, we have, in those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart, the spirit descending like a dove on him, and a voice came from heaven, you are my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. There's no, like Mark, Mark has a tendency to be, first of all, because he was the first uh, gospel author uh, written, it was the first gospel that was published, uh, it has a tendency to be more clipped, more shortened. Uh, it doesn't have those extra sources that uh, Matthew and Luke um, used as well, uh, those Luke and uh, unique sources, those Matthean uh, unique sources, as well as as Q source. Um, so Ma Mark doesn't even deal with the problem, um, other than to say, you know, that John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of the repentance for the forgiveness of sins, um, and explains who he is a little bit, and then says that Jesus gets baptized. Luke uh, is probably the most most lengthy account of this. Uh, after after John the Baptist, of course, calls out everybody that comes to see him. Um, he says, "All oh, right." Uh, so if you look at Luke eighteen, uh, Luke uh, chapter three, verses eighteen. So with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the good news to people. But Herod, the ruler who had been rebuked by him because of Herodias, his brother's wife, and because of all the evil things that Herod had done, added to them all by shutting up John in prison. Now, when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, then we have the revelation of, of the dove coming down, the, the uh, heaven being opened. So Luke kind of bypasses it. He dances around it. He doesn't even say that John the Baptist baptized Jesus. Uh, so while Matthew says that you know, there's this interplay between Jesus and John the Baptist and Jesus explaining why he needs to be baptized, Luke dismisses it completely and just says, well, Jesus got baptized. Doesn't say it was by John the Baptist explicitly. John does something similar. Um, John in... Uh, John here says, the next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said after me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. So we don't even have um, John the Baptist baptizing Jesus in the Gospel of John. Uh, we just have him lending credence to uh, the anointing of Jesus that takes place uh, directly after the baptism. So each of the Gospel authors tackle this in really unique ways. Um, it's really only Matthew that we have uh, John the Baptist actually baptizing Jesus. Is that is that a revelation for y'all? Mm -hmm. <laughs> we have a tendency to um, harmonize the Gospels, to read it as one distinct narrative, when in reality there's these multiple uh, threads that we kind of weave together to make one story. Uh, but when we do that, we often set aside some theological issues that would be better to wrestle with. So we're still left with the question because Matthew addresses it in in some way, but Mark, Luke, and John bypass the issue of uh, John the Baptist baptizing Jesus. Um, John names it in some way by saying, you know, uh, I'm after me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he was before me. Uh, naming the hierarchy, uh, the this this heavenly hierarchy of John the Baptist and Jesus. Uh, Luke doesn't touch on it, other than saying that Jesus had been baptized, which still has some issue of why Jesus needed to be baptized. It's just not addressed. Mark bypasses it completely. Um, oh my goodness! Please silence your phones, everybody. <laughs> Sorry. Um, 
we do have uh, Mark says at least that he was baptized by John in the Jordan, but doesn't doesn't name the issue as to why um, or or the potential conflict of why Jesus needed to be baptized in the first place. So the only answer we really have as to why Jesus needed to be baptized was in Matthew. Uh, luckily, that's our reading for today. Let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. John the Baptist has a problem with it. Uh, I need to be baptized by you, and you do this for me, and you come to me. Uh, so what does it mean that Jesus needed to be baptized to fulfill all righteousness? That's really the only explanation we have in Scripture. That's why I'm here today. <laughs> That is a good answer. So we would have to define what it means to fulfill righteousness. Uh, what does it mean in this situation that Jesus needs to be found righteous? The only hint that Mark gives us, uh, Matthew, excuse me, gives us, is uh, in chapter 1, he talks about Joseph as righteous. Uh, we see that in 119. Now the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. Um, righteousness, then, at least from the context that we hear uh, both in Jesus' baptism and in uh, the, the first chapter of Matthew, uh, explains contextually that to be righteous means to follow the commands of God. So uh, for Jesus, at least according to the Gospel of Matthew, um, this, this baptism was necessary for God's will to be fulfilled. That still doesn't really answer our question, doesn't it? It's righteous even without being baptized. That Jesus had to be baptized in order to be righteous? Can of worms here. Yeah. So, well, it, if Joseph, if this is happening before John the Baptist is really laying out this new uh, concept of ritual immersion that also functions as uh, sin or debt forgiveness, uh, it, it would make sense, especially Joseph being a Jewish person, uh, this this. Although John the Baptist was Jewish as well, and so was Jesus. So we need to take that into consideration. Um, but at least that tradition of ritual immersion looked different for uh, traditional Jewish folks prior to John the Baptist and Jesus. Um, but Joseph would have known what the law... So righteousness uh, is in some way tied to impunity of the law. Um Joseph knows that there are certain regulations laid out in the Torah for uh, uh, an adulterer, right? So that's why he moves in the way he does. Uh, he could have had her stoned, you know, like we talked about in, in the infancy narratives when we were focusing on that. That was an option that was available in scripture. Uh, but Joseph, wanting to do the kind thing as well as the right thing chooses to dismiss her quietly, which is also an available option. And that shows us righteousness. Uh, so something about it, since that's the only, that's the first time we hear that word. And this is the second time we hear that word in Matthew. Uh, it would suggest some parallel that uh, Jesus is trying to not only do the right thing according to the law, but is trying to do something that is best practice. Um, still doesn't answer our question though, does it? So I don't think Jesus needed to be baptized. I think we needed to see him baptized. That is one of the uh, primary arguments. Um, if Jesus is sinless, which is orthodox theology, but is not necessarily everybody's theology. We're disciples. We can hold that in tension. Um, you run into some issues with atonement uh, theology if Jesus was sinful and still manages to remove sin from humans. We have to figure out, you know, the equation for that. Um, but if Jesus was sinless, as is as is dogmatically true uh, amongst most Christians, uh, there's no need for forgiveness of sin other than as a teachable moment. 
which would make sense uh jesus being a rabbi uh being being a teacher uh this would be a opportunity to especially if we see jesus in the uh frame of a prophet uh, a lot of the prophets had a tendency to act out uh god's will through i don't know you might almost call it performance art right uh, in the same way with the the great Greek thinkers like Diogenes who lived um who lived in squalor to try and show uh that that everything's vanity you know uh we see you know uh oh no who was the prophet that married a, a prostitute um oh my goodness gave his kids terrible names to kind to show the nature of uh of God's faithfulness even to uh the to israel's unfaithfulness i mean it's in there believe me take a look if you want it's, it's in there but the prophets uh have a tendency to use um yeah like almost like an acting almost like uh uh public displays to try and show uh proper action uh proper thought orthodoxy orthopraxy is what we would call that now it wouldn't have been called that at the time um but we do see that uh, we can argue that here um, that one of the reasons that Jesus then was baptized was to show what baptism should be for us. Um, it's a strengthening of the, of, of John's laying out this new form of ritual immersion that also functions as forgiveness of sins and reconciliation. Um, so Jesus is then strengthening that and laying that out further, um, in process. We could uh, also argue that I had a few other. Those, those are primarily the two reasons that we see. Um, we could also argue that this was an opportunity because it was uh, uh, Jesus showing his righteousness uh, of falling into God's will. Uh, that this is showing Jesus's humility and obedience, um, even in the form of debasing himself, right? If he is the, if he's the son of God, if he's the the anointed one, the Messiah, uh, then showing this, this, uh, I wouldn't call it humiliating, but certainly debasing act uh, is a reminder of how we uh, can move with righteousness though we're certainly not that higher high up in in the heavenly hierarchy were you looking up the answer there i was trying to but i couldn't find it couldn't find it <laughs> we'll get it we'll get it after we we'll get it after the the study's over um so it makes sense why john here is hesitant to baptize jesus uh if he's saying that it's for the forgiveness of sins and jesus he knows to be blameless uh, why why would he want to? Uh, Jesus answers, it's to fulfill righteousness. And what's John going to say then? Well, you know, I still disagree, but I'm going to do it. Um, so John the Baptist baptizes him. And what we have now is a direct divine revelation that sets up the ministry of Jesus. Uh, it's it, So Jesus is an adult now. He went from last chapter, he was an infant. Uh, John the Baptist shows up. And now Jesus is an adult and he's ready to begin his adult ministry. Uh, we have that uh, portrayed in all of the gospels, although not all the gospels have an infancy narrative. So in some of them, Jesus just shows up as an adult, uh, but we do have the baptism. That is the beginning of uh, Jesus's public ministry. And they all play out at least in some way with a divine revelation. Uh, the revelation has a couple different parts to it. There is, uh, of its nature, the the baptism, the the water immersion. Uh, when he comes out of the water, or when he steps out, or when he, uh, we actually we hear it portrayed in different ways. If we look at the parallels, we see. Uh, and when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came out of the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and he saw a spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, "This is my son, the beloved." with whom I am well pleased. In Mark, it says, in those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. 
And just as he was coming out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, the beloved, with whom I am, with you I am well pleased. Luke says, now when all the people were baptized and when Jesus had also been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. In John we have, and John testified, I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. So in John, we get direct revelations. We get everybody naming that Jesus is the Son of God. Uh, we have that at the very beginning of John. So John's not trying to build up to anything. John starts out pretty strongly. Uh, the word was with God and the word was God. And so John lays out the preeminent logos of Christ at the very beginning of the story and continues it. Um, in Mark, this is the first revelation uh, that this is the son. Uh, Luke has the same story, but Luke always has everybody praying. Luke is all about prayer. No matter what they're doing, they're praying. Uh, they're walking to the store and they're praying. And that's what Luke does. Um Matthew has a tendency to work through it in a way that uh, we remember that Matthew was writing to um, a Jewish audience primarily. So this is uh, a way to explain not only the difference in the nature of baptism, uh, but why Jesus and why why John the Baptist had an issue with it, why Jesus explains it. Uh, but it all the revelation functions the exact same, which I think is so interesting. That even though there's these discrepancies throughout the Gospels, um, the revelation is nearly identical in all four of the Gospels. The heavens open up, a voice says something, specifically says the same thing. This is my son, the beloved, or you are my son, the beloved, um, with whom I am well pleased. The Greek word for there, for beloved, is um, agape beloved son loved deeply loved son um the word son there can mean a couple different things but it kind of it has a close relational aspect um kid son something like that with you i am well pleased or with whom i am well pleased remain not in john though um he on whom you see the spirit to spend and remain is the one who I'm sorry, wait a second. I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove and it remained on him. Yeah, we don't have the I am well pleased in, in John. That's interesting. With you, I am well pleased. So we have um, kind of an inauguration of Jesus's public ministry with this, uh, an anointing in baptism and in blessing from the divine as to what Jesus is going to be, his identity, what he'll be doing moving forward. And it makes sense because directly from this, he goes right into the wilderness uh, to further prepare himself. So this is almost like acknowledging the calling, uh, which is in some ways is the way we treat um, baptism by immersion within many faith traditions. It's a, uh, it's a bringing into adulthood. We treat, uh, culturally, we treat it as a coming of age ceremony, um, differently than than infant baptism or, or dedication. Uh, we baptism by immersion at the age of consent is similar to uh, first communion. It's similar to it functions truly as a as a coming of age ceremony. This is the beginning of this person's adult life in so many ways, and we're setting them forward on this path of, of righteousness. We still use that same sort of language. So baptism has been set uh, for us as to what it is by Jesus's baptism. And I think, Julie, you, you nailed that on the, uh, hit the nail on the head there, uh, that this lays out the foundation of what baptism is for us. Even though Jesus didn't need to be baptized according to, to uh, Orthodox theology, we do need it, and we have the ritual laid out um, 
through this perfect event? I I think that I think that for me, um, this says like so much about Christianity that not all Christians believe. But I think that here that um, the Bible is showing us kind of like how John the Baptist isn't an interlocutor for God, right? Because it's the voice. It's the voice from heaven that says, I am well pleased with you. You are my son, right? It's not John the Baptist is conferring something onto Jesus. Yeah, very true. Yeah, it's direct revelation that happens here. This is the this is the creator God uh, who is um, breaking into creation in an old school miracle. This is the way that God breaks through in the Hebrew scriptures. Uh this is, you know, the, this is God showing up in the clouds, Monty Python style. Uh, this right. is God saying, hey, everybody look, y'all need to see this because this doesn't work this way normally. This is a a breaking of the natural order. This is a breaking of the laws of physics um, in, in what we would consider uh, a miracle, a biblical miracle. We talk about miracles differently now, don't we? We talk about miracles as... Um, you know, I, I, oh, I got the last box of whatever at the grocery store or, you know, uh, but, you know, biblical miracles were things happening that shouldn't be happening. God showing <laughs> physical form. Uh, we talk about small miracles, but, but, uh, this is one of the big ones. This is, uh, not only do we have God showing up, but we have the first, uh, Trinitarian, uh, formula that shows up in scripture. We have all three, the the big three that show up in this event to usher in Jesus's ministry. Uh, we run into some theological issues here about what the nature of the spirit is. Uh, if the spirit comes down on Pentecost, what's the spirit doing here? And the spirit shows up in the Hebrew scriptures too. So is it more of a Trinitarianism as its own? We could do, we, we could spend our lives trying to figure out the, uh, the nature of the Trinity and uh, a, a cohesive overview of scripture in in the depictions of of the trinitarian formula um it, it took christians probably about four centuries to get anywhere near that so i don't think we're going to do that today um but but it is interesting that we have that here um this is the very first time that we have uh in in dramatic and thematic elements all three persons of the trinity that show up uh, the, we have the Holy Spirit descending like a dove, uh, and that would be an interesting word study. Um, we have doves show up a couple places in Hebrew scriptures, uh, in Genesis, um, in the flood. Uh, it's usually a sign of life or of creation. Um, interestingly, in world religion, uh, a dove was seen as an agent of Zeus. Uh, so kind of a, a harbinger of the of the big deity uh in in the roman pantheon but the, you know it, the dove does play a, a larger part historically in, in the hebrew scriptures as well so it's not that it's being usurped uh to diminish zeus's power in this situation although some uh um folks that would have been uh, Hellenistic, which, you know, at this point in time, the ancient Near East in the first century would have been Hellenized Jews. So they would have been familiar uh, with the Roman pantheon, considering that Rome occupied the, the ancient Near East at this time, they would have been familiar with these deities. Uh, so you might be able to read this as a little bit of subversion as well. I, I would love to hear, I would love to see a study on that, uh, that this might have been a little, a little shot in. Uh, yeah, yeah, I could see it being a little dig. Um, oh, y'all worship Zeus? Well, look what we got, you know? Um, what does this tell us about the Trinity? I should, I should ask, is there, are y'all Trinitarians? Uh, you don't have to be. <laughs> I am. I am. You are, Julie? I am. You are? Um, yes. Yeah. Oh, Paige Lynn, fun. Okay. I, um, am, am occasionally a Trinitarian. I'm not... <laughs> <laughs> um within the disciples even within the the uh, disciples of christ uh movement within the stone campbell movement the restoration movement there's even been debate uh because 
the Trinity is not laid out cohesively in Scripture. Uh, there's there's references to Father Creator God. There's references to Christ, uh, the Anointed, the Messiah. There's references to the Spirit. Um, but there and and there's one one or two places where there is a Trinitarian formula, but it's more so in greeting or salutation than it is anything else. There's no uh, theological laying out of the Trinity in Scripture. It's there, but it's really um, it is it is obscure. Uh, and it's really, it, it's why it's one of the most difficult doctrines to define in Christianity. Uh, there's no real clarifying of it in scripture other than to say it exists and what that nature of the Trinity is, has been debated for the entirety of Christianity. Uh, but at least within the restoration movement, um, Alexander Campbell was a Trinitarian. Barton Stone was a duotarian, uh, which means he did away with the, um, the divinity of the Holy Spirit. Uh, if you only if you do away with the divinity of of Jesus, you end up being a Unitarian. Uh, which, if you want to know what Unitarian Universalists believe, mm -hmm. uh, that would be it's just the authority of God, uh, and it lessens the the authority. Uh, it lessens the Christology uh, of the Christ and 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 uh, of and and the pneumatology of the Spirit. Um, that's, a lot of some folks wrap their salvation up in trinitarian formula um some folks don't uh, that's that's another study i don't know what else to say about that um but we do have that information laid out and we have it at least in our scripture reading for the for today uh a an allusion to the three persons of the godhead functioning in relationship uh, and that's probably the most important aspect in my opinion of the trinity is that we know God in relationship and God knows God's self in perfect relationship. So if there's anything that we can strive for to fulfill righteousness, it is to strive for perfect relationship with each other and with the divine. It, it is an unfortunate aspect of reality that we are usually pretty terrible at both. Um, so we're left with all of this. A model for what baptism should be for us. If Jesus didn't need to be baptized, but instead shows it as a ritual for us, uh, and it amounts to not only the forgiveness of sins, but also a reconciliation to righteous relationship, uh, that imputes on us what baptism should be. Sorry, hold on one second. First Christian Church, this is Pastor Chris. One second, y'all. So um, before we get to our application of what baptism means for us or our own personal baptism, any questions about discrepancies in in the parallels or the nature of jesus's baptism or what john had issue with or the trinitarian formula revealed here any anything anything that we can talk further about that we've very quickly overviewed thinking on the trinity is that the holy spirit was there at the beginning with god with jesus all, all three mm -hmm. and in acts jesus left the holy the trinity there to us to to help us mm -hmm. What's that word? Paraclete? Yes. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. <laughs> the, the helper. Mm -hmm. So the Trinity is is our helper. Yeah. And that, uh, but I I think the Trinity the the Holy Spirit has been there from the beginning, but just not I don't know usable for the people of God. Okay. 
I, I think that's a traditional understanding of it as well. We don't see the spirit. We don't see the Holy Spirit um, fully present up until Pentecost. We see glimpses of the spirit. Uh, the spirit will sometimes be present for some people. And it'll function almost like a miracle, like those old the the Hebrew scripture miracles, where it'll be a an actual inbreaking into creation from a a, a God who is transcendent. So the spirit uh, functions like God does in transcendency that that it's an inbreaking into creation. Uh, once we see the uh, Pentecost take place, it, uh, well, once we see the incarnation take place in Christ, suddenly it's not just it, suddenly God, the Creator, is not just transcendent, but also imminent. Uh, that 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 God is present with us and abides with us. In the person of Jesus, of course, Jesus is a person and has to then leave. Uh, and, and then we have the paraclete, the helper, the advocate, uh, who is eternally present and, and saturating creation in a way that is somehow not pantheistic, which which is, is um, problematic to work through, but it has been done well in 2000 years of Christian history. We, we can maybe take a look at some, like the Athanasius Creed is a good example of how the Trinity is thought to function um in historical orthodox theology uh but i think you i think you named it well pantheology that's multiple gods pantheism is um the idea that uh um that god is everything uh not just that god is in everything but the god is everything uh, which is se seen generally as a, a heretical uh, viewpoint because it diminishes the the personhood of the divine as father god creator god um so when we talk about god in three persons in traditional trinitarian theology it's very much as three distinct individuals not not people not anthropomorphized people uh but individual entities uh pantheism is kind of a god is everything god is not any one thing um and it ends up being oftentimes you see this in like a worship of nature uh, or of uh, sometimes an ancestral worship, uh, mostly in, in in nature worship, because everything is God. Um, Trinitarian formula would not allow for that uh, because then we end up worshiping everything as distinct gods is kind of the criticism of it. And it's been di dismissed as as heretical, non-orthodox thought uh, pretty early on. Uh, in, in Christian theology. Uh, but yeah, yeah, good. Thank you. All right. So one of the things that we haven't talked about mm -hmm. is how the baptism takes place in nature. It doesn't take place in a church. It takes place at the river and the sky opening up is in the dove coming down. It's like, it's all natural. Mm -hmm. So I think that um, I think the Bible is revealing something to us here about the nature of uh, church. Okay. I mean, that sounds weird. It, it sounded better in my head. <laughs> No, I don't. I, I think that you probably are on to to something there. Um, can, would you? Could you say more? Or yeah, so to... it's like it goes along with what I was saying about John the Baptist. It's like in this situation, the Pharisees and the Sadducees are not around, right? Like we imagine the people that are hanging out with John the Baptist are like cool people, <laughs> and you know, in the whole. The whole exchange with like, well, you should be baptizing me. I shouldn't be baptizing you. And Jesus is like, no, no, no. This is righteous. This is how we're going to do it. And um, th this happens, you know, at the river right before Jesus goes into the wilderness. It tells us as Christians that we can find God in the world we don't have to go to church 
Oh, that's dangerous talk right there. I don't want to <laughs> wait a second. Wait a second. No, what I'm saying is it's like, like, it's not a thing where uh, John the Baptist sat down and was like, okay, let's see. Are you good enough? Are you good enough for me to baptize? And like, you know, it's, it's not something being transferred or decided upon by John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. It's decided upon by God. And so what happens with the sky opening up, it, it really doesn't have a lot to do with John the Baptist. That's fair. For Jesus, at least. Um, so I think of it like, you know, churches that are saying like, well, you can't come to our church or you can't be part of our church or you can't you know become a christian or you can't be baptized like i'm used to i come from the roman catholic church so there's like all sorts of things that you have to do in order to get a sacrament and um i i, I think that this story says the opposite of that that it's like you you know even jesus christ was baptized by john the baptist I think it can be read as a challenge to ecumenical structures, and, and I appreciate that hearing, uh, especially in uh, perhaps an overly ordered uh, religious structure like like we have in a lot of denominations now, uh, that things are a little too legislated. Um, yes. And that's part of the issue of what Jesus ran into with the Pharisees, uh, that things were were too legalistic. Um, so what I I, I I will say, I really enjoy arguing any side of an argument. It doesn't mean that I that I hold a particular vantage point. I just really like arguing and debating the the the, the different perspectives. That's usually how I come to a conclusion myself is I just it it angers to no end my my spouse because she never knows quite where I am and I just argue. She's like, well, this is what you believe. And I go, well, maybe I do believe that, but let's, you know, let me argue this point right now. Um, so we do have John calling out some of the folks that come to be baptized um, and, and putting them kind of through a ringer. Uh, I mean, because these folks are coming into the wilderness to the River Jordan to hear him talk. And one of the first things he said to him is, you know, you brood of vipers who told you, who told you to flee from the wrath that is coming. Um, so there is some challenge to the religiosity of the folks that are coming to meet him. And he is calling for repentance. He is calling uh, for um, contrition as a, a basic aspect of forgiveness of sins. Um, it, part of part of recognizing that we need to be that we are sinful is and that we need to be forgiven is recognizing what we have done that is sinful and and repenting of it so there is that call for it uh and and john the baptist at least with all those folks that are not jesus uh does hold them to some standard to attain baptism uh but for jesus i mean he can't call him out for not being righteous right and even right. Jesus is saying like for this is going to make things righteous to fulfill all righteousness uh so he's kind of breaking the mold here in this brand new type of baptism that john the baptist just started immediately the mold is broken by jesus um but it, you're, i do like the idea that this is something that is happening beyond the regulations of humanity that this is something that is divinely ordained and it's something that it, it's where the idea of sacrament comes in uh sacrament is something that is god's nature uniquely different in this place um within roman catholicism like you mentioned uh, uh orthodox christianity eastern orthodox christianity uh and within a lot of protestantism uh sacraments are viewed as something where god's nature is different in presence uh we see that in probably the easiest way to describe that is through uh the sacrament of communion or the lord's supper where uh transubstantiation or consubstantiation depending on the theology of of, of the eucharist uh, actually becomes the presence of god uh if not in in uh form then in an essence which would be the description of uh transubstantiation um disciples uh, interchangeably use sacrament with ordinance ordinance is uh that's usually my theology 
Uh, I'll argue that things are an ordinance and that if we have the spirit saturating creation already in the nature it, it, with the in the person of the Trinity, if we have the Holy Spirit that is present with all of us, abiding with us, uh, God's not going to be more present in any one place than another. It doesn't matter if we're having communion or if we're getting married or if we're dying or if we're becoming priests, right? Uh, God's everywhere. So most of our, and this is a lower theology, uh, a lower um, uh, theology of, of sacrament or ordinance, that uh, what we do in marriage, in uh, forgiveness of sins, extreme unction, last rites, uh, baptism, communion. It's more so a, a human uh, ritual that remembers how what God has already done for us. Um, you, you might heard it said it's uh, an outward recollection of an inward change that has already occurred, right? Um, and we usually kind of use that language, but, you know, we don't there's no right or wrong way, at least, in, unless it becomes overly legalistic and we end up using these opportunities for grace and divine intervention as uh, gates to keep people out. Right, right. And which has been done. That's how that's how the Stone Campbell movement really got started. Uh, Alexander Campbell was part of a Cedar Presbyterian movement where you needed to get a token to have communion to say that you believe the right things, you acted the right way. Uh, he went in, tossed the coin and started his <laughs> movement where everybody could have communion. Uh, you know, I just talked to a, um, a pastor probably a month ago and uh, she she's a new pastor and she was struggling with um, the rituals that she had in her church. And she was like, I don't really like repeating the same thing every single week it seems mundane mm. in a way and I said well it's like you know re repetition with teaching my child how to talk you know like so we are you know God's children and everything and so we as humans and simple-minded humans we need these rituals you know I like that. So, yeah uh, it's a ha it's habit forming it, it's it, it's comforting yeah I, I i like those yes i like hearing those words at the communion table and me too mm -hmm. but <laughs> uh, every morning our family does a little uh devotion and part of it is the lord's prayer and i'll be absolutely honest there's probably a few times where i have mumbled through it and not given my full attention to it uh but I also know that I can recall it now because of my repetition in times where I absolutely need it, uh, where it can be that source of comfort, where it can be encouragement. Uh, and I, you know, we talk about that with some folks say that about disciples and communion. You all have communion every week. It's going to lose its its uh, its function. It's going to lose its power. Uh, we don't say that about other things in Christianity. You say like I did a good deed today. You did a good deed again today. Well, it's going to lose its uh, <laughs> power. You know why? Why not just do a good deed every couple months? Because then it's going to be more meaningful to you. You know, we don't we don't use it that way. Um, sometimes ritual can be rote uh, by by nature. Uh, rituals are going to be sometimes something that becomes second nature to us. And when things become second nature, they become subconscious or reflex. Uh, but that really just means we've integrated them into our personhood. I think uh, it, it's it's like. Oh, trying to work out or trying to go running, you know, the, the first couple years that you try and do it, uh, you know, you know, you're doing it and you know, it's a struggle, but eventually I'm told if you do it long enough that eventually it, it becomes second nature and it's something you can just slip into. Uh, I, I, I hold dearest those rituals of Christianity that have become so comfortable to me that I can slip into them without realizing that. It, they're, they're often a first indicator that I that I'm not in as good of shape as I think I am. If I find myself uh, reciting the sinner's prayer, uh, the Jesus prayer, uh, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Uh, if I if I hear myself cycling through that, I, I have to I go, oh, gosh, I need to take a step back and reevaluate what I'm doing because something is is off center. Something's out of line in my life. Uh, so it's often those rote rituals that are the first indicator for me that 
that something is off uh, if I'm not fully behind it or if I'm if it's coming into my subconscious. So I, I understand both arguments. Um, and I also recognize that there's very different kinds of people uh, as part of this creation. And I honor that diversity. For some folks, ritual might lose its value. Uh, but for me, it does not. And, 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 you know, that's why we got different denominations. That's perfectly fine if, if, uh, if you want to go to a place that has communion every, well, like us, anytime you get two or three of us together, we're going to break bread. You know? <laughs> uh, and that's never lost its value for me. In fact, it's helped me to know people better. Uh, I've only seen it as valuable. I understand, though, that, that sometimes you wouldn't. And I particularly understand, Paige Lynn, that um, it can be more difficult for clergy. Uh, as the folks who have to initiate these rituals, who feel obligated uh, to do, it's a hobby is great, but if you need that hobby for, um, if that hobby becomes a job, it's not nearly as fun for some reason. You know, it, it, I have I have fun organizing my house, but as soon as I'm told to clean something, it's not fun anymore. And I kind of think that, uh, you know, clergy face that in a unique way, but we all do when we're when we're told uh, or if it's expected uh, from from other folks, suddenly that ritual might not have the same value. Uh, but that's part of human nature, I think, and and is unique to each of us. Yeah, I I mean, I do weddings, you know, um, I officiate weddings and she also officiates wedding and weddings and I officiated her wedding um <laughs> <laughs> but uh so yeah I I felt like a you know from officiant to officiant speaking about a ritual in a way and I basically have like a regular outline of a wedding that I go with every single time and it may not be like it may seem mundane but I know that it's special to someone else. And, you know, we just go to the Lord's table every week. But, I mean, it doesn't change for me. I still, you know, it depends on the person you are. But, you know, it still holds this value for me, like you said, Chris. So, yeah. I, I, I you know, something as simple. Well, look at our other secular rituals, right? Uh, eat, we, we all got to eat a couple times every day. Uh, and it can become something that we don't pay attention to. But we can also turn it into something that is a meaningful practice. We can gather around the table at dinner and share our days. We can we can turn it into something that has more meaning. Uh, so it's really, it is the way we approach it. Um, but we can't all be expected to approach it every moment as if it were holy, even though it is. Uh, we just don't have that mental capacity to recognize that there's too many moments and we get lost in them uh and usually it's only when when we've lost too many of them in a row that we look back and remember how precious any individual moment is uh hopefully those rituals can remind us without us having to get into a slump and reevaluate our entire lives uh, that, for me that's i think the power of ritual is that it's a a calling us into um into God's time rather than ordinary time. Uh, hopefully, not always. We we got to meet. We got to meet there for it to happen that way. So let, let me ask then to springboard from that. I know we're we're a little short on time, but do y'all remember your baptisms? Pretty much. Yeah. Pretty much, and it wasn't. It wasn't what it should have been. Oh. <laughs> I I was eleven years old. You know, it it just it could have meant so much more, but that wasn't I don't know, that wasn't the case. I remember being embarrassed because my wet robe, you know, showed through my <laughs> my garment that I had on underneath, and I remember being kind of nervous and scared and and they were just words that I said, mm -hmm. I, I, it didn't have the meaning, but I don't feel the need to be baptized again either. I think, I think I know in my head now what, you know, what happened, what the importance of it. Yeah. So. I, 
you know, I can't think of a major life event that I have went through where I haven't looked back on it and said, boy, I wish I would have been more present or, you know, it's yeah. marriage. I was worried about everything going right, you know, and because uh, I had put together the service and I was like, oh, geez, what are they going to think about the service I put together? I read from Song of Solomon and I was like, is this a little too dicey to be reading for a wedding? <laughs> um, the the birth of my first kid it was i i was trying to be as present as i could but it was like 4 a.m and i can only do so much in that situation you know <laughs> baptism the same thing it's you know it's hard to be fully present when you're an 11 year old yeah. uh, and hard not to worry about everything else that's going on uh anybody have any in breakings did, did the the heavens open up and a and a dove fly down did y'all get that no no nobody okay All right. no but, but I, definitely, uh, I don't know i um when I'm always in our church, I always uh, see the light coming through the windows. And I, you know, I feel that uh, God is speaking to me or everybody there, you know. So, I mean, that's uh, the same every Sunday and it was the same for my baptism. So that was good. Oh, that's awesome. I appreciate that, Paige Lynn. Thank you. My pleasure. And Paige Lynn, I got to say, I probably got more out of your baptism than I did my own. Huh. That was that was a special time and to hear you read your statement um that was that really touched me you did have a profound statement i i appreciated that as well i appreciated working with you through that and we didn't have to do anything like that when i was baptized you mm. get dumped you go back <laughs> you know, oh wow thing. yeah <laughs> yeah i i keep hearing from different people that the church was different a long time ago but i only came what a month after pastor chris came so yeah. i have no idea other than you know the time that pastor chris has been in, in service to this church you know so i don't <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's it oh. every place is always different before you get there mm -hmm. <laughs> i was baptized 59 years ago i mean that's that's a long time to remember <laughs> that is true I uh, yeah all right well um consider then in in sending forth uh remember some details about your baptism uh think through it and, and reflect on it consider what it has done for you um and consider what whether you consider it a sacrament or an ordinance consider what the presence of the nature of the divine was in that situation or, or in all situations um Think about not just you know what you said but what the event has has caused you to be um we've all had time to grow in some facet of our lives since our baptisms uh so reflect on what that event has caused us to be uh as as we are today and if it is time to to revisit that you know if maybe too many of our moments have slipped away and we need to reevaluate re what we are doing with our time or 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 how we are called to serve. I think uh, remembering our baptism or, or recalling those rituals that have meant a lot to us can can do that. Um, so if nothing else, by Jesus and John the Baptist instituting this new form of baptism uh, for the forgiveness of sins, we have an opportunity to reflect on our human nature, where we have sinned, where we need to find reconciliation, redemption, uh, what we need to forgive others for as well. It, it's, uh, it's a call to be reflective of our journey uh, in Christ's footsteps as we have been baptized. When we read the story of Jesus' baptism, it should intimately remind us of our own baptism, of our own death and rebirth, uh, and whether we are still part of that new creation, what that means, what redemption looks like for us. And I know that that gets into atonement and a whole bunch of other things, but at the very least, it should cause us to reflect on our faith journeys and uh, to consider where we are on the path and how we might more readily uh, step forward in that path of righteousness. So a little mini sermon at the end. <laughs> uh, any other questions for the good of the order here? Not a question, but I did find it was Hosea. Hosea, thank you. Well, He's the prophet that married the, the, the prostitute. prostitute. His, his kids' names, I can't remember what they are, but they were, it was. The first chapter of Hosea. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> I'll check it out. I'll check it out. So Hosea, thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. All right. So, um, well, we invite you to to head out and, and uh, live oh, out. pray. You almost forgot we have to pray. Um, I'll be happy to. I'll be happy to.
Thank you, Julian. Uh, let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for the ways that you have spoken to us. Uh, we give you thanks for the ways you have revealed yourself to those gospel authors, to the ways that you revealed yourself to Christ in baptism, and the ways that you reveal yourself to us today. Allow us as we go forth to, oh, well, if you wouldn't mind it, God, if you could break through these clouds and give us a little bit of sunshine, but if not, break through and allow us to experience your presence, experience uh, you as you abide with us as we go forth in this place. Allow us to live righteous lives, that we might be reminded of our baptism of death and, and new creation, and that we might be those agents of new creation that work with the Spirit in this place in each moment of our lives to do your will and to bring about the realm which your Son has taught us of. In all these things, we give thanks, and we pray through the Spirit and through the Christ. Amen. Amen. See you all next week.